this Howie Hawkins, and I'm going to introduce him myself. Howie, will you come up? one of the original founders, original founders of the Green Party. And he's run for governor twice in New York after a prior run for the U.S. Senate in 2006. He's a Syracuse resident. He's a Teamster working for the United Parcel Service who's been endorsed by numerous political labor education organizations and teachers unions especially. This is really important in, in relation to the talk by, by Stephen Walsh because teachers unions are a very fertile ground for monetary reform. They can, the other thing we realize, they're smarter than, than average obviously because they're teachers and they know how to teach other people about this topic. So this is a natural place for us to, uh, to work in. Uh, okay, teachers unions, He's, uh, how he's been supported by a number of teachers' unions, including New York's Bad Ass Teachers Association. I don't know what that is, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph Nader supported Howie. Uh, the New Progressive Alliance, numerous others. And by receiving over 5% of the New York vote, he maintained the green pallet, ballot line for the next four years, but it's an important milestone in an election like that. One highlight of his campaign, and this is really very impressive, was that Ralph Nader held two events to help promote Howie's candidacy. I know how big a deal that is because we've tried to work with Ralph Nader, and I'll tell you about that later if we, you know, at some point. It, 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 it's interesting. We've been in touch for several years with Howie. We joined the Green Party's shadow cabinet as monetary director at Howie's suggestion. He convinced me to do that, though I had doubts. And since September of 2010, the Green Party's National Committee, as we mentioned, has approved a monetary reform plan, which closely echoes Kucinich's Need Act, National Emergency Employment Defense Act. It's the first time very first time in our nation's 225-year history that any important political party in this country has put forward real monetary reform, the whole thing. And we, res we support that wholeheartedly. That, that plank, as, as we mentioned, is in your conference kit. Howie's going to discuss how third parties can bring new issues into the mainstream of public debate not let the two major parties take movements for reform for granted because they have nowhere else to take their votes. He'll include some history on the Greenback Labor Party as it relates to monetary reform. He'll talk about the Greens, their growth, their support for monetary reform. And we look forward to helping them do that in the coming years. Please welcome Holly Hawkins. Good morning, thank you for that introduction. Um, I've been, I feel like I've been a green before it was green. In 1964, I was 12 years old coming up in California and Ronald Reagan's running around the state uh, supporting a referendum to repeal the Fair Housing Act, the Rumsford Act. And in November, they succeeded. And this is, you know, civil rights was on everybody's minds. At 12 years old, I came up in a mixed community and you couldn't avoid the issue. 
Yeah. And uh, so yeah. I said, okay, the Republicans are not for people's rights. Let's see what the Democrats do. There were the Freedom Democrats coming up from Mississippi trying to get uh, seated in Atlantic City in, in New Jersey. And I heard the news that they did not get seated. So I'm asking there, 12 years old, where's my party? I later learned that John Lewis asked the same question in his speech the previous year at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. So my party ended up being the Peace and Freedom Party in California that started uh, registering people and getting them on the ballot in late 1967. By now I'm a freshman in high school. And I consider that, and when I write a history of the Green Party, I'm going to make this argument, to be the first Green Party. Because I think the Green Parties around the world are the political expression of the new left. Uh, going beyond the communists and socialists and the good things they did, they tried to incorporate and the bad things they tried to go beyond. Uh, bringing in new issues like anti-colonialism and anti-racism and feminism and ecology and peace. These are issues that transcended particular, you know, class issues that the old left was focused on. And in California, the uh, Peace and Freedom Party had a plank on ecology, not just conservation, which had been in the major party planks for, you know, since the early part of the 1900s, um, but ecology were related how we're organized as a society impacts the way we relate to nature. And so uh, a lot of those issues were carried forward. You know, the Citizens Party was a pretty explicit effort to um, bring these politics forward. Petra Kelly, the famous German Green, considered the Citizens Party to be America's Green Party. That was 1980, Barry Palmer, the environmental scientist, was the uh, presidential candidate. So I was involved in Peace and Freedom Party and Citizens Party. And, uh, the People's Party running Ben Spock in 72 for president. Um, and then in 1984, uh, there was a call to a meeting. I, I had been active in the clamshell lines, which occupied the Seabrook nuclear power plant site in uh, 19, first of 76, and then we had a big occupation in the spring of 77. The anti-nuclear movement exploded out of that, and so we were kind of notorious. So. A couple of us got invited to represent them at this meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota, where we formed a network of local organizing committees, and you know the, the party began to develop. So um, that's sort of how I got into this, and, and actually over the years I've looked back in history, and I want to talk something about that because you know you may be sitting there saying, okay, the Green Party adopted the monetary reform plan that the American Monetary Institute is for. So what? The Green Party is small, somebody said yesterday. And I would say, don't underestimate us. Um, we have leverage, and we have 130 electeds around the country. We have the case of Gail McLaughlin in Richmond, California, and some other Greens. Uh, Chevron had a big industrial accident. 10% of Chevron's worldwide revenues are from a refinery on the coast of Richmond. They have 34 miles of coastline on San Francisco Bay. And a lot of it's undeveloped. Military had it, so they, they're trying to figure out what to do with that now. But Chevron's out there. They had a big fire and explosion. 15,000 people sent to the hospital. And the city government then had there, until the Greens got in, had been basically a subsidiary of Chevron. And Gail McLaughlin and, and a couple other folks uh, got elected, and she became the mayor. And uh, they sued Chevron, and they got you know reparations. And then they started looking around, the foreclosure crisis was really bad in, uh, in Richmond. So they decided if the banks won't uh, mark down the mortgages to their current market cost, they would take the uh, mortgages over by eminent domain and finance, refinance them themselves. Now that's in court, Wall Street went bananas when they heard that. But that's the kind of thing Greens can do. So last year, 2014, the uh, Chevron spent over $3 million running their own slate of candidates against these Greens who couldn't raise anywhere near that money, and the Greens won. Gail was uh, term limited, she's back on the council. But uh, so, you know, don't underestimate us. You know, my race for uh, governor in New York was mentioned, and uh, I ran in 2010, and what I think we did with that campaign and I only got 1.3% of the vote, but we gave voice to the anti-fracking movement. And that became the central fight 
the biggest mass movement except for the Any Common Core stuff, which came up a couple of years later. And there's a lot of opt out. You know, we had over 200,000 students in New York State opt out uh, last spring. Um, that became a big movement. We gave voice to that. And uh, again in 2014, and right after the election, we finally got the health department report to Governor Cuomo, who had been silent on this for five years or more. And uh, he accepted the report. We banned fracking in New York. I think you know, we had something to do with that. And then another uh, key demand was $15 an hour minimum wage statewide. Well, two days ago, Cuomo invited in Joe Biden and said he's going for a $15 piece of legislation next year because he can see which way the wind is blowing. Our 5% is more than any independent left candidate has got in New York history, except for two socialists in 1918 and 1920, when you know the socialists were the only anti-war party at that time. It was a big issue. So without you know that kind of turmoil, and you, if you know that period, that's when J. Edgar Hoover got his start, when he had the red summer of 1919, race riots, repression, socialists really got clobbered, um, but they had a base. It was a very tumultuous time. We had, you know, these movements. Education was a big one. That's why I got half a dozen teachers locals to endorse me in defiance of the state union, which wanted to remain neutral, which Governor Cuomo, that, that was, he didn't like that. And they'd been neutral in 2010, so he got a very bad test punish and privatized uh, program adopted into the state budget this year. And we're fighting the consequences of that right now like in my hometown of Syracuse, where 18 of 34 public schools are slated for so-called receivership, where the state's going to take it over and hand it over to charters, which is going to bankrupt the school district because of all the overhead remains that you're giving all this money for the students to go to these private schools. Now you say charters are public, but we got a charter system, school system in uh, Harlem called Success Academies, even Moskowitz, she's had a lot of notoriety. And she went to court and, and basically the uh, city comptroller wanted to look at her books. She said, no, we're private, you can't. And the judge agreed. So it's privatization even though they get public money. To call them public schools is like, say, Lockheed Martin is a nationalized state-owned corporation. They have a contract with, this, with the government, but they aren't owned by the government. So uh, that's all to say that our 5% didn't win the office, but it did leverage some power. And as Howard Switzer pointed out yesterday, you can win office and not win the power, because most of the power isn't up for election, like the power to issue money. And I think one of the things that uh, we need to think about is the history of how the money question was put front and center by third parties in the antebellum period, the Gilded Age, or sometimes called the Greenback Era. And if you look at third parties from abolitionism, the Liberty Party, Free Soil, Republicans, the Whigs split, the Republicans, the third party became the major party. And then the populists, the farmer labor-based parties, which was union or labor reform, and then greenback labor, and then union labor, and then peoples. And I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, right up until socialism, you know, the Debsian socialists. They were central to American politics. They were unavoidable. You know, the socialists in 1912, uh, it was a four-party race. You know, Roosevelt split the Republicans and took over the Follett's progressive movement. So you had three self-styled progressives and a socialist in that race. Uh, different, very, much broader debate than we have today. Our presidential candidate, Jill Stein, got arrested trying to attend a debate for which she had a ticket. Ralph Nader running in 2000 had a ticket to go to the debate and they wouldn't let him in. He left without getting arrested. Jill was a little more stubborn. And so, as Howard pointed out yesterday, she spent eight hours in lockdown along with Sherry Honkala, the vice presidential candidate, with 13, 16 security people in some warehouse of a dark site, handcuffed to a chair, incommunicado. Their lawyers didn't know where they were, their staff didn't know where they were. Uh, the kind of thing you'd expect in, you know, a repressive state like Turkey or something. That's how they handled it. So, 1912, much broader debate, and that's because in the previous 60 years, 70 years, there had been 80 years, you know, third parties were really part of the discussion. So, 
I want to spend a few minutes, you know, going over this period because, as I said, they put the the money questions front and center. And as you probably know, you know, after the Civil War, there was a war debt, and the banking interest, the Eastern establishment, wanted it paid back uh, in gold-based, gold-backed dollars, um, and that was contractionary. We had a deflationary period which was ruinous for the farmers. They were steadily being pushed off their own land into sharecropping situations. It wasn't just black folks, it was white folks too. And uh, it was really hard for business too, you know, particularly the small merchants and manufacturers in that period because credit with prices deflating, the money you borrow now is more expensive to pay back later. And so it became a real problem. So the, two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, were gold parties. And so the labor movement first, and then the farmers' organizations began saying, we've got to have expand the money supply. And they came up with the idea that the government should issue greenbacks, U.S. notes, instead of having bank-issued notes. And uh, they ran on that platform all through that period uh, in the latter half of the uh, 19th century. And what they, what they also had were movements. You know, the, the first party was the Labor Reform Party, which was formed by the National Labor Union, which formed right after the Civil War. It was the first National Labor Federation. It had problems, and just as they could launch the Labor Reform Party, the Union Federation fell apart, but it spawned later the Knights of Labor and the AFL. Um, and so there were, union organizations underlying these third parties. And then the next wave was the Greenback Labor Party, which uh, relied a lot on bringing the farmers in as well as labor, and the Grange, the patrons of husbandry, which exploded across the country after the Civil War, became the institutional base, the movement base for that party. And the next phase the, was the Knights of Labor, and that became the uh, Union Labor Party, and uh, now we're up to 1888, and then finally, 1888, and then finally the People's Party, and that was the base under that was the uh, Farmers Alliances, which included millions of farmers. Uh, there was a Black Alliance and a White Alliance, a Northern Alliance, and two Southern Alliances, and they cooperated, and it was a tremendous mass movement with grassroots education. You had barely literate people. I mean, the South didn't have public education until the Reconstruction governments tried to start it, and then the Redeemers came back in and tried to shut them down, and they disenfranchised poor whites as well as blacks. But people still got a really good financial education from these institutions. They had an independent press. They had these local organizations where people met face to face and talked these things out. They had traveling lecturers. And so people that were very literate had a really sophisticated understanding of how the man as the furnishing merchant was called for the sharecroppers, how the man was standing on their back and how they were going to get him off their back. And uh, so that was uh, sort of the, the milieu in which these things developed. And I want to take a couple minutes and read uh, excerpts from some of these planks. And uh, in them, you have the basic three elements about what we're talking about today. Money issued by the U.S. government, greenbacks. Uh, full reserve banking or 100% reserves, that's a little vague and uh, it's not as, they weren't as clear on that as, as we are today. But they were certainly clear that they wanted to issue these greenbacks and spend their money into circulation and expand the monetary base to be adequate to the size of the population and level of commerce uh, and help the farmers and the small business people and the working class uh, basically get on their feet again. because. What you had post-Civil War with the Panic of 1873 is what they called the Long Depression, which was worse than the Great Depression in terms of unemployment levels and bankruptcies and just how far the bottom was. And it, you know, it, it was boom and bust over the Long Depression, and different economists dated differently. Um, some from 1873 until 1896. Others say it was until I forget the year 18 mid-1880s, and then there was another panic in 1893. 
And these third party movements, these farm labor movements, kind of ebbed and flowed with the, the rise and fall of the economy in that period. So the first of these was, as I mentioned, the Labor Reform Party. And, uh, you know, they advocated the eight hour day of worker co ops. They wanted to end contra contract and convict labor, which was the new slavery that the South was trying to reimpose. Equal pay for women, equal rights for blacks. I mean, there was a strong resistance to the end of Reconstruction in 1877, right until 1900 from these third parties. And, uh, but the centerpiece of their platforms was always the money question and how to take on the money power. So the second point in the Labor Reform Party's platform, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read some excerpts. It's the duty of government to, to establish a purely national circulating medium issued directly to the people without the intervention of any system of banking corporations. And the Labor Reform Party kind of fell apart as the National Labor Union did, but uh, the reformers, the third party movement, uh, began calling themselves greenbackers, because they wanted greenbacks. And by 1876, they had a presidential campaign. Uh, the, the Labor Reform Party got, what, 1% or something? 1872, yeah, they, uh, they were falling apart as they got started. They only got 18,000 votes. So they kind of put the idea out there in the election, but really didn't get too far. 1876, they did better, but they were still trying to pull together. Uh, 1873 is when the crisis hit and the Long Depression started. And so a lot of these third party, greenback, independent, labor parties were forming all over working men's parties. And then they came together in a convention and uh, they aimed to restore prosperity by expanding the money supply and issuing greenbacks. And they ran Peter Cooper, who was a abolitionist and manufacturer and founded the Cooper Union in New York. He was 80 years old, so he was like not really a serious presidential prospect, particularly in that era. But he symbolized what they were talking about. And he did get about 1% of the vote. Uh, and the platform said, we believe that a United States note issued directly by the government uh, will afford the best circulating medium ever devised. And then they quote Thomas Jefferson that, quote, bank paper must be suppressed and the circulation restored to the nation to whom it belongs, end quote. Which I did a little digging around. That's, that's some letters he wrote in, uh, around 1812 to a guy named Epps. I think that's where that quote comes from. So the presidential election got things started. They didn't do too well in the presidential election, but election in 1876, but in 1878, Greenback candidates got 14% of all the congressional votes nationwide. They elected scores of local, state, and several uh, members of Congress. So they were a real force in the major parties who were debating, you know, the Democrats and Republicans were debating the tariff. But that was an intellectual argument. It was really waving the bloody flag, the Civil War. The South voted Democrat, the North Republican, except for the machines in, that were developing in the northern cities were Democrat. And well, they were Republicans and Democrats. They were competing. Um, but because of these third party movements, they had to at least defend their, their hard money policies. So 1880 was the Greenback Labor Party. Again, uh, Currency reform was its centerpiece, and they ran James Weaver, who was later the People's Party candidate in 1892. In 1880, uh, he ran, he was the first candidate to barnstorm the country, because back then candidates would sit on their front porch and tell the reporter stuff, and they telegraph it around. And it's, it was seen as grubby to go out and ask for people's votes. Well, this Civil War general said, I'm going out, and he went down south, where you now we're after the Compromise of 1877, he insisted on integrated audiences. They were armed to defend themselves from the Klan. It was a very courageous campaign. And uh, they had trouble, but they uh, did better than they did uh, four years earlier and got 3.3% of the vote, 300,000 votes. And if you want a good book to read about this period, Mark Louse, who's a Green and an historian in Cincinnati, has a book called The Civil War's Last Campaign, James B. Weaver, The Greenback Labor Party, in the politics of race and section. And um, I think the Greens in particular, once you start reading it, you're not going to be able to put it down. It's, a, it's very well written and uh, 
uh, brings to light a history that they do forgotten. So in 1876, their platform said, corporate control of the volume of money has been the means of dividing society into the hostile classes, of the unjust distribution of the products of labor, and of building up monopolies of associated capital with power to confiscate private property, i.e. small farmers. It has kept money scarce, and scarcity of money enforces debt, and debt engenders usury, and usury ends in the bankruptcy of the borrower. So that's their preface. Therefore, we declare sovereign power to be maintained by the people for the common benefit. The delegation of this right to corporations is a surrender of the, the central attribute of sovereignty. All money, whether metallic or paper, should be issued in its volume, volume controlled by government and not by or through banking corporations. So in uh, going to the next election, 1884, uh, the economy started to come back, and the greenbackers kind of ran out of gas, but they were still there. They ran Benjamin Butler, another Civil War general, who, along with Thaddeus Stevens, and the, as a radical Republican in Congress, had argued right at the end of the Civil War for repudiating the debt by issuing greenbacks to pay off the debt to the banks instead of having it paid back with the gold back, uh, with the gold back standard. And they were called the repudiationists. They're basically telling Wall Street to eat it and uh, let the people, you know, have the money they need to, to thrive. Um, and Butler uh, is also famous during the Civil War because he's the general that figured out how to liberate the slaves by calling them contraband property from, you know, abandoned uh, plantations. And it forced Lincoln's hand to bring the slaves into the Union Army in the end. So he has a place in history, but I don't think people know so how much he played on the money question, which, you know, Stephen's book says he's one, one of the guys in that period that really understood money. And he was the presidential candidate, and they got only 1.3% down from 3% the last time. Uh, but they kept that, uh, that greenback program alive. And uh, they claimed in their, their platform, uh, we point to pride Point with pride to our history, we have stopped the wholesale destruction of greenback currency. You know, they were issuing greenbacks, it just was not exclusive, and there were also banknotes being issued. And there was a Supreme Court decision that the government does have the right to issue money, and so they claimed uh, credit for that. And uh, so they said, we demand, in their plank, again the first plank, we demand the issue of such money in sufficient quantities to supply the actual demand of trade and commerce. We demand the substitution of greenback for national banknotes. Uh, so the next wave after the greenbacks was the unions came back uh, based on the Knights of Labor. And also Henry George had a United Labor campaign in 1886, which, you know, Marx and Engels back, I mean, Marx, Engels back, I think Marx, when did he die? I know Engels did because I've quoted this a lot. And, you know, there were German exiles from, you know, the 1848 revolutions, and they formed the Socialist Labor Party, which worked in the Greenback movement in the Union Labor Party, and now the United Labor. And, um, you know, they were like, why should we back Henry George? You know, he's not a socialist. And Engels said, yeah, but he's independent. And that's what we learned in 1848. If the working people don't speak for themselves, nobody else is going to take care of them. And what happened in 1848 was, you know, it was the, the professionals and the small business and even big business against the landed elite. And when the professionals, the middle class, got the franchise, they said later for the working class. And the working class got sold out. And these revolutions spread across Europe and even into Brazil and Colombia. It was one of the big fights for democracy. And, you know, the, the fight for democracy meant for working people, they got to have their own party. And that was the lesson these people took, you know, these 48ers, exiles from Europe, went into the independent third party movement. But a lot of them, you know, were socialists and Engels like pulling out his hair. These people are so dogmatic, you know, they expect the program to be perfect. And, and Henry George ran with 150 unions in New York City backing him. 
And he came in second, Tammany Hall won. Who came in third? Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, this was a very significant campaign. So they tried to go national, and there were two conventions in Cincinnati, one with the Georges, and George kind of turned against the socialists, and the other was a much broader convention, including the socialists. So they had two conventions. They adopted similar planks, uh, and the, the United Labor uh, Party, which was the Georges, did very poorly. They got, uh, you know, just, just write that down. Yeah, they only got 3,000 votes. Whereas the union labor, which was the broader thing, got 1.3% uh, of the vote, 147,000. Um, and both their platforms were almost word for word the same on the money question. And, you know, they wanted a national monetary system by which the circulating medium is issued directly to the people without the intervention of banks. And uh, finally, the People's Party, which grew out of these farmers' alliances I talked about. And they again ran General Weaver and ended up getting a million votes, 8.5%. And uh, they won five states, got 22 electoral votes. They elected, uh, they got 10% of the vote for the House. They elected 39 members of the House, six senators, and 11 governors. And again, the money question was front and center. And if you've ever read the preamble to the populist thing, I'm kind of going a little longer. I, I'll try to cut down the excerpts I was going to read, but I'll just read a little bit of it. Uh, the fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few, unprecedented in the history of mankind. The possessors of these in turn despise the republic and endanger liberty. From the same prolific womb of governmental injustice, we breed the two great classes, tramps and millionaires. And then they go straight into the money question. The national power to create money is appropriated to enrich bondholders. A vast public debt payable and legal tender currency has been funded into gold-bearing bonds, thereby adding, to the, adding millions to the burdens of the people. And I've skipped some of the rest of that. Uh, but they basically want to restore the government of the republic to the hands of the plain people. That's who they said they spoke for with which class our government originated. And then we therefore declare, uh, we demand a national currency, safe, sound, flexible, issued by the general government only, a full legal tender for all debts, public and private, and that without the use of banking corporations. So that was the highlight. What happened in 1896 was the, uh, what was happening with the People's Party is they were frustrated with the greenback claim. And then there was this movement to monetize silver, and there was a big fight throughout that period. They demonetized it for a while. And the free silver movement was kind of a phony populism. Lawrence Goodwin, his book was mentioned in one of the discussion yesterday, The Democratic Promise, calls it the shadow populist movement. It was backed by the silver mining interests and people like William Randolph Hearst. And they got William Jennings Bryan to be their, uh, their speaker. And the populists were divided. And one of the things, I think one of the lessons we need to learn from this period is that fusion means confusion. Because where the Farmers Alliances were strong, the People's Party was based on them and they were accountable to the populist program. Where they were weak, uh, those states would send delegations basically of opportunists who would, if they were in the North, they'd be Democrats, really, who would say they were populists and they were trying to get the Democrats and populists together to compete better with the Republicans. In the South, it was the opposite. It was the populists and the Republicans. And they practiced fusion. They often won state governments and then couldn't implement their program because the major party allies of the populists really weren't with the populist program. And that's what William Jennings Bryan was in 1896, and it killed the People's Party. Uh, he basically accepted the nomination of the People's Party as well as the Democratic Party. The People's Party nominated their own vice president, who and was Tom Watson from Georgia, who uh, William Jennings Bryan would have nothing to do with. Bryan was not for greenbacks, and for none of that. He was just for free silver. And you know, he gave this famous speech, you know, don't crucify us on the cross of gold. But it was not populism. It was basically the silver Democrats. And so what happened in the next period was the socialists had been you know, for greenbacks, the Socialist Labor Party started running their own candidates in 1892 and 1896, and 
had a very succinct platform. The United States shall have the exclusive right to issue money. But then they dropped it by 1900, and they became very sectarian, and Eugene Debs pulled together the Socialist Party, which was strong for the next period. But they thought, if we just take over the banks and have them under democratic control, we've solved the question. And the whole analysis of uh, private issue money versus public money was lost. The populists continued it. There was the People's Party kept running until 1908. I'm not going to have time to read their planks. The Progressive Party of Teddy Roosevelt, there was an echo in their platform. Um, and they opposed the Aldrich Act, which authorized the commission, which eventually led to the Federal Reserve. So there were echoes of this. There was a farmer labor party movement uh, from 1920 to 1932, uh, which had a lot of problems because the socialists and communists now were competing for influence on the left, and then there were the populists. And they were all there, and they couldn't pull it together. And, uh, but they had you know, monetary planks. And unfortunately, because the left abandoned this, the monetary question was uh, fell to the, and the people talking about greenbacks and monetary expansion fell to the right. Father Coughlin, in, in, in uh, you know, this guy that started social credit, there were green shirts that were like brown shirts, but they were uh, you know, for social credit. And uh, it, you know, the anti-Semitism even furthermore repelled the left from this whole discussion of who issues the money. And uh, so it was lost as we came through the next period. Uh, there was an echo in the Union Party, which, um, see, in, in 1934, the farm, between the Farmer Labor Party and the Progressive Party in Wisconsin, they had, and I've got it here somewhere, I may not be able to find it, but, uh, well, they had two governors, three senators, and about a dozen members of Congress. And Roosevelt was worried that they'd hook up with Huey Long in the South, and Francis Townsend, the old age, pensioner, old age pension guy in California, and form a third party. And uh, that fell apart because Huey Long got assassinated. Floyd Olson, who might have been the candidate, got stomach cancer up in Minnesota. He was the governor for the Farmer Labor Party. And so the people that you know, still want to go forward with this were basically the right, although they got a labor lawyer and a progressive from uh, North Dakota named Lemke to uh, run, and they got 2% of the vote, and they had a plank, I'm not going to read it, but it was the greenback plank. And then we lost the thread, and uh, it wasn't until the Green Party started bringing it back. Now, in 1984, we were talking about money a lot, and, you know, we were all over the map. You know, we had, uh, you know, the, the local currencies, Paul Glover, and Ithaca Hours, the Let's System, Tom Greco, was an author that a lot of people were reading. And uh, some of us got into the uh, question of full reserve banking. I, I got into it because I was uh, working with Goof fighting the loss of industry in the Rust Belt, you know, from Chicago right out through Syracuse. And uh, there were some guy from Virginia, you know, this, he had a little nonprofit institute that was bringing this idea up. And, you know, we examined it. and. I won't have time to go into this, but the Green Party split in the 90s. There were two rival groups, and one of them was the Green Party of the United States, the first one, or Green Party USA. And uh, we adopted a platform plank that I wrote that uh, actually brought some of these questions forward. It wasn't as clear as the current plank, but it was uh, entitled uh, Democratized Monetary Policy in the Federal Reserve System place a 100% reserve requirement on demand deposits in order to return control of monetary policy from private bankers to elected government. And then it talks about, you know, democratizing the Fed and having the regional Fed banks be economic development banks. So, you know, this has been kicking around in our movement for a long time. And then, you know, uh, Dean Barry and Ben Tegelsis, you know, brought it to the fore 2008. Our convention in 2000 was in Chicago, and basically the other group, Nader went to their convention. So basically our group said, well, we got to go where Nader is, because Nader was bigger than both factions, you know, just given his base and his profile. And so we wanted to be where the action was, and that, that's the way we sort of got reunified through Ralph Nader. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about the plank. I, I would also note that the Green Party of uh, England and Wales has adopted a very similar program. Go look that up on the web. I'm not going to. Uh, maybe I read a little bit. It says that all national currency, both in cash and electronic form, 
will be created free of any associated debt by a national monetary authority that is accountable to Parliament. Uh, so it manages the stock of money, and uh, <clears throat> it will be spent into circulation in the economy in accordance with the budget approved by Parliament. So basically the same thing we're talking about here. And uh, so you got two green parties, and uh, hopefully it will spread to Canada and, and other places. And bring this question back to the fore like it was a century ago that third parties put on, on, on the table. And I was going to try to limit it to 30 minutes, but I, I just want to maybe hit a few points on how we can rebuild the third party movement uh, so we can put this issue front and center. Because I think we've, we've lost some things. I mentioned fusion as one mistake that the 19th century farmer labor parties made. Another was, instead of having their local unions or farmers organizations be the organization from which delegates were delegated to bodies to do nominations and write platforms. They issued calls to everybody who's interested to show up at a county convention. And then from there, we'll elect state convention delegates, and they'll elect the national delegates. And as I mentioned earlier, the problem was where the farmers alliances or the unions were well organized, you got delegates who tended to be down with the program. In the other places, you got people who really weren't representing anybody but themselves and their own interests. And that's the traditional American party structure. Everywhere else in the world, you join a party, you pay some dues to finance it, and you've got to agree to the principles. In America, we got state control parties. You tell the state which party you're in, and in some states you don't even do that, but then the state runs primaries where you nominate your candidates. So the party structure is more a brand than a real organization. Most parties are shifting coalitions of candidate organizations with money behind them. And what we need is a real party. You know, the, uh, Michael Harrington used to argue to take over the Democratic Party and say, we need a second party. No, we need a first party, a real political party. I, was, I stumbled across, uh, you know, I mentioned the socialists in, in uh, New York getting 5.6, 5.7, more, more, higher percentage than I did, uh, 1918, 1920. There were also six assembly members elected that they wouldn't seat because the Democrats and Republicans said they were disloyal because they opposed World War I. And uh, so to justify the exclusion, there's this report where the New York State Assembly researched every socialist movement in the world. And, and so they were trying to justify you know, their repression. And then they got to the New York section and they said, uh, the Socialist Party is not a political party, it's a membership organization. You know, the people pay dues, you know, and they control the organization. Whereas their idea of a party was, you know, the state runs, tells you, you know, you pick a party and then you vote in primaries. And uh, the Socialists were very conscious in that period how the primary system was the difference between participatory democracy and accountability of delegates and plebiscitory democracy, where you send out a choice without letting people talk to each other about what they think about it and get educated. And so it's very easy to manipulate that from the top. Stalin did it, Hitler did it, Saddam Hussein did it. Plebiscites are a way to ratify what you want to do, aside did it in Syria. So um, I think that's another thing we need to to have in mind, we need a membership party that's with local chapters financed by people paying their dues, and then you have delegated structures that are accountable. Um, independence, not fusion, and uh, education. We've got to somehow figure out how to do the kind of education they did back in the farmer labor parties in the 19th century. I mean, they had revival in campus. They took, you know, the Christians would do their the Protestants, the Baptists would do their revivals. Well, the populists took that and they'd have a political revival. They'd do the same thing and everybody would bring their wagons up. It was like wagon training back then and for miles around. And, uh, you know, and, and when, when the crops were planted, before you had to harvest, they'd do these things and it was social. It bound people and they got educated. And uh, it created a counterculture. The, the book uh, Lawrence Goodwin was mentioned yesterday, The Democratic Promise really gives you a sense that it was it was a counterculture, not in the sense we think of today as hippies. And this was another way of thinking about the money question than what was coming from the establishment. And it really educated people at the grassroots. 
So how do we do that? I think we've got to revive some kind of face-to-face -face, uh, local structures, places to meet and so forth because you've got to have that interactive discussion. It can't all be one-way messaging. Um, and then we've got to use the social media and, and, and figure out a way to use it like the old independent press they had in the 19th century. It was a partisan press. It wasn't this phony objectivity where they really, really represent the establishment. You had a democratic press, you had a republican press, and you had the independent press, which represented these third parties. And uh, Appeal to Reason, which came out of Gerard Kansas, through the populist right up into the socialist era, had a circulation of over a million. And you know all the you know leading writers of, of those movements would write there, and so people had a common uh, reference point for what we were talking about. We don't have something like that. I mean, we, you know, we've got these listservs on, on social media. I think we've got to find a way to do that. Um, and I could talk a lot more about how we could pull together how how you know we need a party, not just movements, because movements when they flow party can provide perspectives. Think of Occupy, you know, if the Green Party or somebody had been stronger. And I know we got the monetary reforms into parts of Occupy, but we, it didn't spread very well. And that blew up and then got crushed. Um, and then when movements end, the party, if it's financed and organized, can, can support people and keep the issue alive and keep the education going. It's another reason for a party. Um, and Well, let me just wrap this up. 2016, you know, Bernie Sanders is supposedly radical. I've known Bernie since 1972. I worked on his first two campaigns. He ran for U.S. Senate in the special election that Leahy got elected to, and then uh, he ran for governor. Back then, he really was a socialist, independent, and he had a pretty radical program. Now, he's running as a Democrat, and his way of dealing with the financial problem is break up the big banks. So you take the six, big, six big banks that got the majority of assets, and what, you create 12 or 20? People hate the big banks. You got 12 big ones instead of 20, or 20 big ones instead of six, is that going to make much difference? I don't think so. Um, that's where, you know, people are going to need a plan B in all likelihood when we get to the you know, end of the road for Bernie, probably in the uh, Super Tuesday in the South, uh, early March next year, and that would be Jill Stein. And, uh, you know, Howard and I are communicating with her. Um, I don't think it's a problem with her opposing the monetary reform. It's a problem with her getting time to focus on it and sort of absorb it. She's got to, she doesn't come out with a position until she really knows the inside out and she can defend it. But I think uh, that, let me just say this, when I ran for governor, we had a progressive or a liberal challenge club in the Democratic primary. And she stole all the money in media that I was hoping to get over the summer. But instead of attacking her, I just told her people, that was Zephyr Teach Out, uh, you're going to need plan B after the primary, and I'll likely that on your plan B. And we did get about half of her vote. She got about 200,000 votes, so did I. And there was about 100,000 of those votes, we think, you know, came to us because our gubernatorial ticket got about twice as many votes as our candidates for a comptroller attorney general. So there's a big potential there, and that would mean, you know, Jill Stein could get, if she got 5%, let's put it this way, there'd be millions of dollars available in presidential campaign funds in 20, uh, in the general election in 2020 for the Green Party campaign. So that's something we're shooting for. And like I said, a small vote that makes the third parties, or the two major parties, not take us for granted. And if we don't speak for ourselves, if we, if we don't speak for ourselves, we disappear. And I think one of the lessons of the, for the left, you know, since the 30s when they went into the New Deal coalition and stopped being a radical alternative but supporters of the liberal programs, the left disappeared. I mean, as a viable part of American political discussion. Unlike the previous period from abolitionism through socialism via the former labor parties and so if we don't speak for ourselves, we won't be heard. And if you try to speak through the Democrats, I call it political ventriloquism. You know, I mean, you're like trying to get them to say this, do that. But if, if they can take your vote for granted, they're not going to do it. So I'll stop there. And Thank you all.
six 